How many know and how many love your Bible? How many just, you love it? This here is my very first Bible. 1976, 47 years. This is the one, Kathy, I used when I visited Cornerstone up in Mountain View. And I don't know, 19, 1981. And I still remember, I put it on the top of my car and we drove away and it fell off onto the, onto the street. And I, this scar right here, right here, was from when it got scarred. But how many know that this here, this is, I love this book. I love, I love what's inside it. It's not just a piece of paper and words, it's life. It's love. And the more I'm in it, the more I discover all that the God has for us, all that the Lord wants to do for us. And we're going to be talking about this here this morning. And my goal, the goal this morning, when you leave, is my prayer is that every one of us here take another step further in regards to your compassion, your desire, your fervency, having a love relationship with the Word of God. And not just the book, but the love relationship with the Lord in his word in your life. How many know the word of God changes you? The word of God loves you. The word of God, God works within your life, you know. And so here this morning, we have some people here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, Doris, that that, that, that word is your life. It's your joy. You've committed absolutely to reading, obeying, learning, and growing in your relationship with the Lord through that word. And how many here this morning just say, you know what, that's, that's me. I love God's word. I love what he has said to me. I abide in that word, etc. Okay, so, but then there are some like me, a week before I got saved, back in 1976, I'm at a party, beer can in my hand, in college, and I said, oh, the Bible, that was just written for ignorant people of low IQ 2,000 years ago so that people can kind of relate to society, right? And you, people are even doing that today. They're undermining the authenticity of the word of God and that is, there's a lot of questions. Is it the Bible, et cetera? So there's a lot of questions here. We're gonna to touch on that this morning briefly. And maybe there are those here this morning, you're like that couple that got married during World War II. The husband was in the army after they got married. He was shipped off overseas into the Pacific and he wrote almost every other day to his wife, expressing his love, his missing her, his looking forward to be seeing her, seeing her again, etc. So he's overseas and she got to thinking, how come I have not heard from my husband? And for almost two years, she didn't receive any letters. And he returns and he finds his wife distraught, discouraged. Did you not love me? Did you not want to communicate with me? He says, I wrote to you almost every day, every other day. Did you not get my letters? And what had happened was something happened down at the post office, right down the street from where she lived, where the letters never did get to her. They were in a box in a warehouse. And after about 40 years, somebody knocked on the door and said, hey, we found these letters that were discarded. And he showed her, listen, 40 years ago, I did write to you. And I told you that I love you. I miss you. I want to be with you. I look forward to returning with you, etc. She had no idea. And so it is with many believers. Their Bible is on a shelf collecting dust. And it's a love letter from the Father. And they never open it. They did not know it was there. They did not know what was available to you. My prayer this morning is that there is a passion. There's a, an ignition of God's love inside your heart for the word of God. And when you leave here in the next 33 minute, 32 minutes and 57 seconds here, that you will have a new commitment to not only reading the word of God, but also loving the Lord of the word and having a passion to relate with him because he's talking. How many know God's talking people, right? God's talking to you and he wants to speak with us. And so let's go ahead and there's three things I wanted to share briefly here this morning. Number one is the faithfulness of God's word. How many know God's word is totally faithful, totally true, but there's a lot of challenges to that. But Jesus made a statement in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter five, Listen to this. Jesus said, for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, we've read that for many years, and, but what we don't know is what Jesus was referring to. He's referring to some letters in the Hebrew alphabet. 
And what we have up on the screen here, let me show this to you here, if you can throw that up here. I used the word Jehovah or Yahweh that we sang about it this morning. These are the Hebrew words Y-H-W-H. And I use this as an example to show what Jesus was saying. He says, guys, listen, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but not one jot or one tittle, or more accurately, not one yod or tittle is going to pass away. So what was he referring to? Over here, the very first letter, this is yod in the Hebrew alphabet. And Jesus said, listen, guys, not one yod or even one little, little bitty swoosh will go unfulfilled. You thought Nike came up with the swoosh, right? No, no, God had one years and years and years ago. Nike says, just go do it. And Jesus says, I've already done it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Jesus is saying, guys, listen, every I, the dot, every T that's crossed, every comma, every semicolon, guys, he's saying my word is not going to pass away. Your word, everything else is going to change, but my word will never change. You can go to the bank on it. You can count your life on it. It will be absolutely accurate. And because of that, we have now today, we know as the Bible. Let me share with you just some thoughts that I've read recently on the history and the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible is the only religious writing that offers eternal salvation as a free gift. The Bible contains the greatest moral standards of any book in history. Only the Bible begins with the creation of the universe and contains a continuous historical record of mankind to the end. Only the Bible contains detailed prophecies about a coming savior of the world. Only the Bible offers a realistic and permanent solution to human sin and evil. Only the Bible has its accuracy confirmed in history by archeology span and science. And only the Bible has historical characteristics unique despite production over a 1500 year period, 40, year, 40 authors, 66 books, three languages, three continents, and everything coming into an agreement on the same issues. You see, the Bible is the most translated, persecuted, memorized, and uh, purchased book in history. Over 1,700 translations around the world. I mean, I can go on, I got a long list here. But only the Bible is the only book that has never gone obsolete. And it never will. One fourth of the Bible is yet prophetic to be fulfilled. See, there's a word in the Bible there that talks about what God has done and what God will do. It's an example. The Bible is all the only book today in history that can rewrite your history. You can put that up on the screen. That's a good point. <laughs> the Bible can rewrite your history. Some of you here, we, everybody here has got a history. I mean, we got some failures. We got some mistakes. We got some regrets. We got things that we've not, we're not proud of, things that, that we did or what things done to us. It's only the Bible when we dig into it, we find out God is the only one that can come in and say, as far as the East is from the West, so far I have removed your transgressions from you. I will throw them in the sea of forgetfulness. Aren't you glad that the Bible is the book that promises you that, hey, old things are passed away, all things can become new. It is totally unique. No other book in history can do that, friends. And not only that, but it's the only book that can show you your destiny off into the future. These are the plans that I have towards you, says the Lord, to give you a future and a hope. And you start and look at what God says about your future. No other book in history states what God has said in his book about your future. You do have a future. You do have a hope. You do have a plan that God has placed with inside you of eternity from beginning of time. And the Bible is the only one that can give you a new beginning. How many are thankful that you can have a new beginning in Christ? Because you see, it's totally unique and totally, totally, totally true and accurate. But here's my story. I got a couple of stories I'm going to share about me. Now, this is me. This is not you. This is me, okay? When I received Christ in 1976, things for a couple of years before that were really dark for me. I received Christ, and for the next several months, things were really good, looking up. But you see, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and I was a good Catholic, and I thought I needed to get a Bible, so I went and got a good, 
I thought, a good Catholic Bible. But then I was told in the church that I went to, it was much like Gateway, that no, no, you shouldn't use it. You should use the King James Version. So I got a King James Version. Then somebody says, no, 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 you should use the American Standard Version. I said, okay, uh, okay. And then the New International came out. I'm thinking, oh. And then you have these footnotes that says, this is not in the original. And this one disagrees with this. And this, my mind got so confused. I was ready to throw this thing away. I was so, what I didn't understand is I was under intense uh, spiritual warfare, Ray. Right? But what I did, now this is me, what I did in order to resolve that question, I went and studied Greek for three years. This is my original Greek New Testament. This was the book that I used to go through and look at all the different manuscripts. This got a listing of all the different manuscripts going back several hundred years, way back, way, way, way from the beginning. And what I found out what is the exact opposite? That the Bible is totally accurate, totally true, totally trustworthy, because there may be some innuendos and things, uh, you know, some statements made uh, that really don't make a whole lot of difference. 99.99% of it is the same on all the different manuscripts. What it did for me is it solidified that I can base my life on this book. I'm not going to be confused by what other, other people are saying, whatever. I ended up with the King James Version. It's, it was okay. And I still quote it. So if I say something out of the King James or thee or thou, then forgive me because that's where I came from. That was my history there. But I want to encourage you, friends, that the Word of God can be true. It is true. It is trustworthy. And you can read it with full confidence that you can base your life on it. Amen? Number two is understanding the power of God in the word of God, understanding the pattern. Now see, for most of us here, this is pretty basic, basic stuff. But let me emphasize a few things here because maybe there's some things that the Lord wants to show us this morning. So as an example, I had a gentleman in my office several years ago, never been to church in his life, had never seen a Bible in his life, didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't know anything about anything. And so here I am, talking to this guy who's strung out on PCP, and I'm trying to figure out, how, where do I start? How do you share Christ with him? And I'm thinking, okay, well, there's, there's a God, there's you know, creation, et cetera, et cetera. And I got kind of frustrated because I wasn't really getting anywhere with our discussion. So I opened my Bible to John 3, 16. I flipped it around and I put it in front of him. I pointed at it and I said, just, just read this scripture, this verse. This is a Bible. Just read this right here. So this guy, he sat in my, in my office in, uh, on this desk, and he says, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He stopped reading, put his head down on the table, began to cry profusely. And I'm sitting back watching not only this guy receive Christ, but the power of the Holy Spirit in combination with the Word of God, because you see how many know the Word of God stands on its own. It's got the power of God inherent within it to be able to make, uh, to see what God can do. Many, many of the promises in there available to him. So right there and then in front of me, he received Jesus Christ. And I saw a demonstration of it. But what we really see happening here is what we see in Genesis chapter 1. If you can put it on the screen here, I'm going to read Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. It darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, watch this. God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was there. What was the Spirit of God doing? Hovering. Waiting. Watching. The Spirit of God was there, just like the Spirit of God is here today. The Spirit of God is in your life. You're born again. You love God. The Spirit of God is in your home. So the Spirit of God is there. But it wasn't until the next verse here where God said, let there be light, that the Holy Spirit and what God said, bam, creation took place. You see, what we learn from that is there's the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God residing available 
for all of God's people, but it was the word of God that activated the power of God to be able to see creation take place. And then we go to the New Testament and we find out Jesus is walking this earth and it's the same Holy Spirit, God looking around and he's preaching, he's sharing. And when anybody opens their heart up to their to the master, it's the Holy Spirit and the word of God to be able to bring about what God has said. You see the promises of God have been made available to us by the cross and by the blood of Jesus and by the resurrection of Jesus. And what we see in the Bible is that the power of God resides in the word of God. Let me break it down to you this way. Every promise of God, and there's over 7,000 promises in the Bible, every one of them contain the power of God to cause that promise to come about. Let me give you an example. Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all your need According to what? His riches and glory. Okay, so here you got the Holy Spirit. You got God's promise. And God says, like it says in Chronicles, his eyes are going back and forth across the earth, looking to show himself strong in behalf of those who walk with him, believe in him. And it's just like Mary, the angel says, hey, here's what's going to happen. Mary says, let it be to me according to your word. Jesus says to Peter, cast your net on the water. Peter says, Lord, we fished all night, but nevertheless at your word. And so what God's doing is he's looking for people to respond to his word because in that word, there contains the power of God to cause that word to come about. So as an example, God says, I will cause, I will meet all your needs. How many people believe that here this morning? How many people believe, for Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all your needs. What God says, listen, I need you to receive this because my spirit is able to come into your life and make that become a reality in your life. And so it is with every other promise regarding your marriages, regarding your kids, regarding your future, regarding your health, every other, either you're regarding your destiny. There are promises available, but don't let them sit on the shelf, friends. We gotta pull them out. We gotta dig into God's word. We gotta see what God has said and what is available to us. And as you do that, you find out, hey, wait a second, you know what? There's a whole lot there available that we have in Christ as we yield to the Holy Spirit in his word. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. Number three is the war over God's word. Now this is gonna help somebody here this morning because you see, you come to church on a Sunday morning or you do your devotions and you see something in the Bible and you get excited about something that you see. And then how many times a short time after that, all hell breaks loose. Anybody ever had that happen? It's where you're thinking, okay, wait a second, I just got this neat revelation where God showed me something, but all of a sudden you're taking a detour or your mind goes bonkers or whatever, family erupts, the dog starts barking or whatever, and things happen which would challenge the word. What's going on, friends, is what Jesus said here in Mark chapter four, verse 14. Let's read here, the farmer sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear Satan comes, when? Immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Everybody here, look at me eyeball to eyeball here this morning. What happens is we hear a word, but then you become a threat. Terry, you become a threat. When you hear the word, and then you hear something that God says to you and you say, okay, that's mine. I'm gonna walk in that. Lord, I wanna receive that. Guidance, prosperity, blessing or whatever. All of a sudden the devil says, no, 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 no. We, we can't allow Terry Peabody to have the word of God come alive in him because it's power, it's authority, and it's something that, in fact, I mean, I've done this several times where you're doing deliverance and the demons are, cast, are screaming out at people. At one time I had some demons scream out at me saying, we hate the word of God. Stop quoting the word of God. It's power we don't have. And you see what happens is, is that you're not the problem. It's the word of God in you is the problem. And because you see, when you get the word of God inside you, then you understand and you get a revelation of your authority in Christ, of the privileges you have in Christ, your inheritance in Christ, your future in Christ, your destiny in Christ. You get an understanding of your prosperity and all the blessings, all those promises. You find out that all of his promises are yes and amen. See, the enemy cannot allow you to figure that out. 
because you become a threat to him. That's why on a Sunday morning, Pastor David or Pastor Kerry or Pastor Jordan, whomever will stand up here, pour out their heart, and then in your, on your way home, all hell breaks loose in the car. Amen? Because you see what's happening is, friends, there is this warfare over the word of God. It's just like God said to Adam, don't eat of the fruit. Satan comes and says, uh, did he really say don't eat the fruit? And then the father says to Jesus, you're my beloved son. And then Satan says, are you, did he, do, are you really the son? And so there's always this challenge going on. My encouragement to you today is don't let the devil take the seed out of your life, out of your heart. Don't let him set up circumstances where you're thinking, where did that come from? Where it came from was because you heard the word. It was planted inside you. Something starting to grow that God wants to do in your life. And many times the enemy sets up circumstances to want to derail God's purposes. Is everybody hearing me this morning? Okay, let me share with you again my story, okay? I have never shared this publicly, but I, wanted, I was impressed by the Lord to do that this morning because it might help some of you. Okay, so after I received Christ, things were good for two or three months, but then all of a sudden things begin to spiral downward again like it was beforehand. A lot of discouragement, despair, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. And it was like, okay, well, I tried this and it's not working and I was going downhill. And, but I was reading my Bible, this Bible right here. I was reading this one day, a couple of months after I received Christ. And I came to this one verse, Mark chapter four. And I read where it says, Satan comes immediately to take the word. I can't explain it, friends, I can't explain it because I can't understand really how it happened, but something came on me. I call it KDA, kill demon anointing. It was something that came on me, I saw it, I saw it in the word, Ray, I saw it in the word. I stood up and I said, now this is me. I said, devil, I'm gonna read this New Testament every week for the next five years, and I'm gonna learn everything I can about you because I'm gonna take you out. You have been trying to take me out. You see, that's me, that's what I did. Yeah, that, is that a lot of reading? It was about 40 chapters a day. And you say, well, isn't that extreme? No, friends, what's extreme is at that time is I was playing college football three to four or five hours every day for every year round, that's extreme. What also was an extreme when I, when I was in college is I was a piano major and specializing in Beethoven sonatas. And what's extreme is practicing Beethoven's Appassionata, Opus 47, Sonata number 23, two, three, four hours a day. And that's just movement number one. And I said goodbye to all that. And I said, I'm gonna commit myself to the word of God. And I began, to, friends, I began a journey that I encourage you guys to do as well. I began a journey. Now, it doesn't have to be 40 chapters. I backed off. Now, I'm doing a lot less. I don't do that now today. But my point being, it's not the volume of writing or reading. It's the word of God becoming alive with inside you. Because I found out, Kathy, as I read the Bible, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, look at this. Jesus said, I can do the same things that he did. Oh, my gosh, look, at I've been raised up and I've been seated with Jesus far above in the heavenly places. Oh, my gosh, look at this. It's, it, it was astounding to me. It was astounding that it says here, I can reign in life with Christ. I've been forgiven. I have eternity. And you begin to go through the word of God where it says you can trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power. You mean I have authority? You mean I can do this? And the more you dig into the word of God, the more you find out there's more gold hidden away, treasure that is endless, friends. And it's even today, some of you veterans that have been around a while, you still go to the word and it still comes alive because the riches of Christ are unsearchable, friends. And I'm telling you, as you dig into the word, you begin to understand more and more of what God has for you and it never ends. And so what happened is set a course where I learned about all my authority, etc., in Christ. And yes, I backed off a little bit over the years. That's a lot of reading in every day, especially when you got six kids. But my point being is that there's a war over the word. The enemy wanted to take it out. And the spirit of God was saying, no, 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 come on, Chris. I've got something for you. Just spend the time Take the time, dig in. I'm going to set you free for you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. That's my story. Amen. All right. What I want to do is go over so, some 
very simple principles here that we have in our devotional that we made for this month here. This little devotional, at the end of each day, there is the acronym SOAP, S-O-A-P. And we use that as a basis of application of the Word of God. Now, for some of us here, this may be very, very simple, but let me walk through this here so that it may be an encouragement. There may be other ways of applying the Word of God into your own life, but what I want to do is just use that as an example to see how we can activate the power of God's Word into our own personal lives. So SOAP, we have in the devotional, stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And we have those in this devotion where you can go ahead each day and write these out and apply the Word of God. Let me go through this and walk it through so you can see how we apply it. So number one is Scripture. And so what we do is you, every day we've got a Scripture reference that you can take and read just one Scripture. And you look at that Scripture, and it may be other Scriptures, there may be things that you have in your own devotions, etc. But my friends, there's daily bread available for every one of us here. And so as you look at the scripture here, there's several things you wanna do. And as you see the scripture, the second thing we wanna do is we wanna look at and make observation of the scripture. Very simple application here. We're looking at the scripture and we're making observation of it. So as an example, I used this in the first service. I was raised a good Catholic, thought about being a priest when I was in high school. And my wife is glad I didn't. Um, it's a different story. Anyway, Psalm 47, verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Okay? So I'm looking at this verse in Psalm 47, verse 1, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this? We didn't do that where I came from. We didn't clap our hands. We definitely didn't shout unto God with the voice of triumph. But here I am, I got my back against the wall thinking, okay, I'm observing, I'm observing this scripture. What am I going to do with this? You see, not only do I read the Bible, but the Bible reads me. Okay? And when I'm reading the Bible, the Bible reads me. It's looking at my heart. It's looking at my motive. It looks at to me what I need to change, what I need to do, whatever. And I could not get away from that one verse. For days, weeks, months, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I don't do that. The Bible says, yes, you are. I go, no, I won't. Yes, you will. And I'm, I couldn't get away from that one observation there because, you know, it's just like the Bible says, love your enemies. No, I don't want to. You know, the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into various hardships and trials. No, I don't want to. I love to have my depression and my anxiety and my discouragement here. I'm comfortable here. The Bible says, no, I'm not going to leave you that way. I'm going to bring you to a place of victory, and this is how you're going to do it. You're going to clap your hands. You're going to shout unto God. You're going to count it all joy when you fall into temptations, and you're going to love your enemies, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And so I had a choice to make. And so do you. What are you going to do? The Bible says to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And you look at that and you have this observation go, okay, what, a, what am I going to do with this here? And then the third thing is application. How am I going to apply this word? So I used my wife in the first service here. She's not here, so I can continue that discussion. <laughs> Where is she at? So the application of it says, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I'm thinking, okay, um, I need to work on that. H how do I do that with this woman that usually sits right there? You know, and it's just like I shared in the first service. My wife cuts my hair, see? And it's, it's, it takes a lot. There's a lot less time nowadays. Just <laughs> right around the edge here. But it was a couple of months ago. She cut my hair and then she stood right in front of me right here. She goes, that's your blow dry. I opened up the refrigerator and I said, Carol, didn't you just go to the grocery store? I thought you bought a bunch of food. This, place, this, this thing's empty. Where did it go? She says, go to the mirror, stand sideways, and you'll see. <laughs> and in that, I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church. <laughs> How do I do that? Lord, help me. So I'm, I, my, it's the intention is to apply the word. So not only does it have to deal with marriages, 
relationships. It deals with every area of life. My question is, is when you read the word, it's not just coming in one area and out the other word. I mean, regardless of however long you've been walking with the Lord, how are you applying the word of God? What do you do? It's going to read your thoughts. It's going to read your motives. It's going to read your actions, etc. And the whole intent is to bring you to a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as you do that, you'll find out the last item is prayer. Okay, so scripture, observation, application, prayer. And in my case, it's Lord, help me with my wife. Forgive her for all the things. No. Anyway, the application and the prayer, being able to pray the word of God out loud, being able to pray, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I need, etc. But it's based, your prayer is based on the word of God. And I encourage people all the time to pray the answer, not the problem. Pray the answer and not the problem. Lord, I don't know what to do. Psalm 32 says, I will teach you and guide you in the way you should go. Okay. And so that's your prayer changes here, right? And you, you're in a situation where he says, I, I, I don't know, I don't know, you know, where to invest my money. Isaiah says, I will teach you to prosper and lead you in the place where you should be. You see, there's so many, many scriptures there where you find out God has already spoken about your situation. And then you make a decision to apply it and make it a part of your life. Amen? All righty. I'm done. I'm done ahead of time. Where's my keyboard player? All right. Let's all stand up here. My prayer here this morning is that we make a fresh commitment to reading, to studying, to loving the Lord. And it's not based upon how many scriptures you read every day. It's based upon hearing from the Lord, hearing from the Holy Spirit. And because you love him and he loves you, he's able to speak into your life. Bring comfort, bring strength, bring guidance, bring hope, bring healing, whatever you need. So Father, this day in Jesus' name, we just thank you for this opportunity for us to gather. I just really sense right now that everybody just raise your hands and just say, Lord, I am going to this day commit to a fresh relationship with you, with the word of God and all that you want to say to me through the word. Lord, we forgive us if we've not paid attention to what your word says or given it time. Forgive us, Lord, if we've been in a situation where we're too busy. Lord, we want today to be able to commit to time in your word, reading, praying, and seeing the fruit of your word. And Lord, in Jesus' name, I just thank you that you give courage and strength to every person here. That Lord, as they leave, that Lord, the enemy does not take what has been sown. That Lord, we have an understanding of the revelation of the warfare and that we guard your word, we protect your word, we live for your word and we ask that you bring it about all your promises and we give you the glory for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody says.